All right, so we're going to be in multiple places, and uh, we'll dive back into this. And obviously, as you can see, Corey Coffee and Conspiracy, uh, this will be week one of the second set, or in other words, we'll be calling Turf Wars, and we'll get to that. I want to remind you of the main verse that we keep going to, and, and I'm going to start bringing all this together. So this summer, we obviously went through seven weeks, and we kind of threw out some topics and we started hitting each one of those topics well this first section that we're going to deal with we're going to deal with a lot of bible and and i want you i want you to notice once again for the sake of just going back over the verse second corinthians 4 4 in whom the god little g that's important of this world have blinded the mind so he's letting you know that satan is the god of this world and every one of us as christians would recognize that and acknowledge that satan is the god of this world. So, because we acknowledge that, we also recognize that the governments, the powers to be, those with major influence are under his direction. And so therefore, he as God is working a plan to get Israel back to him, he's working a plan for the church to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as God's working a way to work all these things so that he can rapture us out, deal with a seven year tribulation, so he can usher in his millennial kingdom, we would have the exact same thing on the opposite side where the Antichrist Christ and Satan and his crew are working to work their deal together. Psalms 2 says that they're all going to come together uh, to fight God, and God will literally sit in heaven and laugh, which, if you think about it, you're going to fight God? All right. So, uh, and, and what we did this summer was kind of hit some highlights. And a lot of the stuff we were not allowed, well, I say we're not allowed, time didn't allow us to get to all of them. And so throughout the remaining part of this year, I'm going to try to go deeper in each one of them. But I've added some, and I'm continuing to add some. But obviously the Rosicrucian, Nephilim, Jesuits, Hollywood, Bilderberg, Vatican, Freemasonry, Knights of Malta, all all that I won't go through it all again now we added some things about land ownership and I'm not talking about me and you owning a piece of property I'm talking about forces or principalities and I'm going to be talking about God. And we're going to get into that tonight on turf wars. Blood families, we're going to talk about super soldiers. We're going to talk about the importance of September 11th. I'm not necessarily talking about what happened in America, but I'm going to take that date September the 11th, and I'm going to trace it all the way back, and we're going to find out about some things. Uh, Dumbs, deep in underground military bases. Mount Hermon, we're going to talk about what went down on Mount Hermon, and we're going to tie it into this land ownership thing. We're going to talk about Greek mythology, and we're going to tie that into Genesis 6. The hybrid age, which that ties into transhumanism, and then SRA, which is satanic ritual abuse. We'll be bringing that out. And so tonight and over the next few weeks, we're going to deal with spiritual turf wars, okay? And, and just to bring you up to speed, I've been to Israel. I don't know if any of you guys have, but guys, it's, it's beautiful. It's cool. But I'll just be honest with you, this piece of property we live in is much better than Israel. So you got to ask yourself, why is there so much fighting over that piece of property that's about the size of New Jersey? And really, to be honest with you, it's about the same look as New Jersey. It's not nothing to write home about. I mean, it's a cool place. Let's just be honest. As a Christian, if the stories of the Bible hadn't happened there, I wouldn't be that impressed with the place. So the question becomes, what's up with these turf wars? Why are they fighting over that piece of property? Okay, and we're going to discuss that. When God says that Israel is my inheritance, talking about himself, and implying that the rest of the nations were not his inheritance, even though at the end of the time he's going to bring them all together, we're going to bring that in. And so some of the questions that I, I emailed everybody today, and I want you to think on pondering these. And you ever stop and think, what does it mean that we're going to rule and reign with him? Brother Jerry was just teaching out of the book of Malachi about ruling with a rod of iron. If you read Revelation 2, which we will get to next week, 
He not only talks about Christ ruling with a rod of iron, he talks about you and I ruling with a rod of iron. Well, what does that mean? Who are we ruling? You know, I mean, you think about it. If we're going to rule and reign with him, who are we going to be ruling over? Now, the easy, quickest answer to that is those that live through the tribulation and will be born during the millennium. But it goes higher than that. Guys, you, you need to understand there is a privilege to being a part of the church, the bride of Christ. No one anywhere will outrank you and I as his bride in that kingdom. Understand, we are by his side. There is people, if we only knew how privileged we are just to be a part of that. All right? Paul said we're going to judge angels. What does that mean? And, and what's funny is Paul goes, he, he's talking about believers you know, going to court and fighting each other. And he says, don't you know that we're going to fight angels? Or uh, not fight. Uh, don't you know that we're going to judge angels? And the quick answer to that is, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and, and the answer to that is, what does that mean, Paul? I mean, what do you mean? Okay, Jesus sent them out two by two. You remember this? But he sent out 70 of them. Why not 68? Why not 72? Why not 35? Why not just the 12? There is a significance on why he sent out 70 people, and it all tie together, okay? Why did he transfigurate on Mount Hermon? In other words, you know, when he goes up, removes the earth suit, Peter, James, and John hit the deck, Peter and, uh, I mean, Elijah and Moses show up. Why did he do it on that specific piece of property? Okay. Now, what does it mean when he says, have no other gods before me? Is he talking about wooden idols? Is he talking about how we make baseball and football a god in our world? Is that what he's referring to? Or is he referring to something else? Okay. Where were the, who were the gods that Satan said to Eve she would be like if he eat, if she ate? We never stop to think about that, do we? Because you notice what Eve doesn't say? Hey, you know, if you eat that fruit, you're going to be like, gods. What gods? Who's God? What do, you, what do you mean gods? She don't say any of that. She says, okay, let me eat. So obviously, she had some understanding about the realm that was around her, but she chose, I mean, like, like I said, if you came up to me 20 years ago and said, hey, you want to be like the gods? I'd be like, who's the gods? Who are we talking about? But she didn't ask that question, all right? So then I want to ask this question, which is going to launch us into the next three weeks. If I went around the room and I said, okay, guys, why is the world so wicked, right? Okay, the obvious answer is the fall of man, right? And we'd all go back to Genesis 3, okay? Well, then the follow-up question is this. Every one of us in this room would agree that we are a product of fallen man and that we are depraved outside of Jesus Christ coming into our life. We have a depraved nature. Okay? So if, if the world is wicked because of, just because of the fall of man, then why is it that Mao Zedong killed a hundred million people and Hitler kills five or six uh, million, Stalin kills 60 million and I haven't killed anybody. Why are they more depraved than I was? Or you are? I mean, think about it. My, my, you ever met somebody? Like my grandmother got saved right before she died. And here's what's interesting. Before she got saved, she was a godly woman. As much as you can, I hope you can understand what I mean by that. She, I, granted, she wasn't saved, but you get what I mean. From a righteousness standpoint, as far as mankind... She was a good person, quality individual. Why wasn't she as depraved as Mao Zedong? If it's just the depravity thing, wouldn't we all be equally depraved? I mean, let's be honest. We teach people that, that we're all sinners separated from God. Okay, great. Then why isn't the world equally depraved? Okay, so... If we have Genesis 3, which is the fall of man, right? 
Now, we would all agree that the world is wicked because of that event. But if you studied beyond that, if you, if you went and studied especially Old Testament history and what the scribes of the Old Testament would have taught, and you would have, if you could have gotten the DeLorean, went back in time, and asked the men of the Old Testament and said, why is the world so depraved? They would tell you, number one, Genesis 3, but they'd also tell you Genesis 6. And what happened with the incursion there where fallen angels came to this planet and had marital relations with human women and their offspring, the Nephilim, end up dying off. Their disembodied spirits become what we know as the demons today. Okay, so they would take you there. But then there's a third circle, which is Genesis 11, which is the Tower of Babel. Okay, so what we know is what went down to the Tower of Babel is they have, remember Babel, before it was ever called the Tower of Babel, the word Babel literally meant the gate of God. In other words, they were trying to enter into a realm there. But anyway, so God looks down, and he realizes what shape they're in, and he says, hey, man, if we don't do something here, uh, there is no stopping these guys. And so God confuses the languages, and that's why it was known as Babel from there on out. He changed the definition of the name. And so what happens is they disperse into different countries. And what we're going to find out is God... Once he disperses these nations out, places entities, or a better word, magistrates, or even a better word, principalities, over each section or country. But then he tells us in Deuteronomy 32, he says, but Israel, that's my portion. Okay, so God basically says, okay, I'm giving up all these nations to go do this thing. And you say, how do you know that? Do you know what happens right after Genesis 11? There's a man in Ur of Chaldees that God calls out. You know who he is? Abraham. And God starts that nation, okay? I'm going to bring all this about, but what I want you to understand is right in this little intersection is the answer to that question. Okay, this area would be the real answer is why is the world so wicked? Because we have some, we have the fall of man, we have the entering of demons, and then we also have these principalities over these nations. And so through the working of those three things, we have all this wickedness that goes on in this planet. And this wickedness will culminate within the tribulation okay so we're going to keep coming back to this now ephesians 6 i'm just going to lay out some verses and going to ask you some questions okay so ephesians comes along and we get to ephesians 6 and we always focus on the armor great we ought to you and i need armor right and we get up every day and we should almost mentally place that armor on just go through the motion of thinking what each one of those pieces are but one of the things that we just miss is what paul says here in verse 12 he says for we wrestle not against flesh and blood so in other words you know since it's you know feinstein is not my enemy okay <laughs> I'm just kind of throwing out something in the news right now. All right? That's not my enemy. Okay? I don't wrestle. Our, our battle isn't with flesh and blood. He's letting you know it's a spiritual battle. But then he lists. He says, but you're going to go up against principalities. Okay? That's a key word. Do you understand that that word denotes geography? principality is someone who's placed over a region or an area okay and so i got you guys see that floating around I, I, thanks i thought i was on something i against powers okay so brian's in the room and brian is a, a cobb county electrical inspector and he has been given the power by the county to either pass or fail, uh, it, it, it denotes an authority. He's a magistrate, if you will. He has got an authority over a general area. Now, Brian couldn't come out to Douglasville and go nuts, but he could go, he could go and, and, and shut down your situation in Cobb County because he's over that area. Okay, now, same thing. Against the rulers of darkness. Okay, who are these rulers? 
Now you say, well, it's Satan. The word is plural. Okay, now I'm not an English major by any means, but I understand that an S on the end of a word means plural. So we have rulers of darkness, and notice what he says, of this world. In other words, this realm. Okay, and then he goes on against spiritual wickedness, then he lets you know in another realm, in high places. So, so far, we haven't learned anything about Ephesians 6 other than we've got some magistrates, some principalities, we've got some folks in power in areas, not only in this realm, but other realms, and that's who we go up against. Now, without getting a basis on who that is, no wonder we fail in spiritual warfare. We don't even know who we're fighting, okay? So, we go on into Colossians. And all we're doing is tracing the verses. It, it, it's going to get interesting. Hang with me. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailed it to his cross. Obviously referencing Jesus, right? Now, he's letting you know when he died on the cross, he was taking all that stuff, that Genesis 3 stuff, and all that stuff you'd accumulated in your life, and he's going to take it and remove it and get it out of the way. And he says, having spoiled, and here are these guys again, principalities and powers. And then he goes on, he says, and he made a show of them openly. Now, the them is referring to the principalities and powers. So when he died on the cross, not only, because remember, what is the wickedness of man? Genesis 3, Genesis 6, Genesis 11. So when Jesus comes and we're reading the gospel, we have a tendency to read the gospel with us in mind, right? Well, I'm just going to read and you know, see what this is about me. Well, cool. I'm glad you did. And Jesus came and he did die for you. But that's not all that Jesus came to do. Okay, Jesus not only came to seek and to save that which was lost, and oh, by the way, you've never been referred to as a that. That which was lost was the image of God, the spiritual being that we were intended to be. Now watch this. So when Jesus came, he came and done three things. It's a threefold ministry, and he came to die for your sins, Genesis 3, but he also came to battle Genesis 6 issues and also overcome Genesis 11 issues. That's why he openly, basically triumphs. We would say he showed up. Basically, he stuck it in the face of them. So all of a sudden, we're going to get to the maniac of Gadara, and he's going to jerk these demons out. And you know what they're going to refer to him? They're going to refer to him as not as Jesus, but the son of the most high. Very specific term in the Old Testament. We're going to get to that. Okay. Ephesians 1.21. Far above all, here's the word again, principalities. And here's the word again. Notice they're always together and they're always in that order. And power. And then he says, and might and dominion. Now we all know what the word dominion is. I mean, you know, Adam was given dominion. Guess what? He lost it. Okay? You remember when Jesus came onto the scene and he's going to start his public ministry? You know, he doesn't start with mankind's issue. He goes out in the wilderness for 40 days, and what happens? He gets tempted by the devil. What's the devil going to do? Offer up the kingdoms to him. Okay? Because he had rulership over it. He says, in every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. So he's letting you know that he is above all principalities and powers, not just in this world, but the world to come. Okay, so he's talking about a group of people, right? Okay, now hang with me. Okay, First Peter says it this way. Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God? Now there is a reason, and with God as my help, well, I'm eventually going to organize all these thoughts and attack each one of these things there is a very reason now we we use this right hand thing all the time well he's you know that's god's strong side and jesus is sitting there and that's why he said no 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 no. he is sitting at the right hand very specifically okay and it's and it's because it's not just god and then jesus at his right hand and nobody else is around 
There's a whole crew of people around. And he's sitting in a place of authority because God has given him a rank above everyone. And that's where that most high thing is going to come in. All right. Now, he says, who has gone into heaven, who is at the right hand of God, angels. Now, authorities and powers. Now, he, he changes up. He doesn't do principalities and powers. He does authorities and powers. But notice he says angels and authorities. Now, can we all agree that that must mean this and this are referring to two different things? Because I wouldn't say Christy's husband and CJ's dad is teaching the class tonight. That's the same person, right? I wouldn't be redundant in that. First of all, you get, well, of course, Christy's husband and CJ's dad, it's the same thing. Now, what we may find out is these angels and these authorities may be of the same kind, but there's something distinctively different about them. And he says powers and being made subject unto him. So everything up here is subject to, to Christ. Now, Romans says it again. Now, I know I'm being a little redundant, but I'm trying to pull out the New Testament to show you what I'm going to show you in the Old Testament. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor, look at the word, angels. Now, you all know the verse here. He says, what's going to separate us from the love of Christ? So he's going to start listing this, some things. Can the angels do it? Nope. Can the principalities do it? Once again, they're obviously different than the angels here. Nor powers. There it is. Principalities and powers. You ever notice that God keeps putting those two together and they're always in that order? Now, he says, nor things present, nor things to come. Now, so we come back to this little thing. Why is the world so wicked? So what we're going to do is break down this Genesis 3, the first part of this, right? And let's figure this thing out. Notice in Genesis 3, 5 and 6, if we're going to talk about what got us in the mess, before we ever get to Genesis 6, before we ever get to Genesis 11, let's see if we can figure out this Genesis 3 thing. He says, for God, and we all know the word, and you probably heard it a hundred times in your life, Elohim, right? Name for God, okay? For God, Elohim, doeth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God's Elohim. There's the same word again. Now, when you and I hear the word God, we assign a specific attribute to that name, right? Now, so if I say God... Or if I stand up on Sunday morning and a whole group of people and I say, hey, guys, what do you think about God? Well, we're going to sign some attributes. Well, he's love. He's judge. He's holy. I mean, we're going to start thinking. But if I went over to the Middle East in the midst of a mosque and I said, tell me about God. Now, notice it's the same word, different set of attributes, right? Okay. The word Elohim is a lot like God is today. It's a little ambiguous, a little, uh, it's a word I'm looking for, a little less detail to it than there should be. But if I look at you and say, tell me about Yahweh, or let me, how about you tell me about Jesus Christ? Now I'm getting specific. So the word Elohim here, for God, Elohim, doeth know that in the day thereof your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as God's Elohim. Now notice the word God's here. In your Bible is translated the word God here is singular we we do the same thing today you think about sheep if I looked at you and talked about sheep am I talking about plural or am I talking about a group of sheep well, what would determine that is the words before and after it right the, the context you would know real quick yeah that's my favorite sheep the word favorite denotes that it's singular or if I say, they are my favorite sheep, well, then you know that the first word pluralizes the second word. Okay, that's what we got going on here. And it's what I just asked. Notice that she doesn't go, who are the gods? Who are the other Elohim? That's not, she doesn't say, okay, I get it. Elohim doeth know that in the day that ye eat of it, that you'll be like the Elohims, basically. And she doesn't go, well, who are they? She had a common knowledge of who these people were, or let me rephrase that, who these 
entities or these beings were, okay? So, I'm going to talk to you about the divine council. Now, that's what we're going to dive into very heavily tonight and into next week. Now, some people call it things like uh, the assembly of the host, or some people will call it the, uh, uh, matter of fact, in, in, in Isaiah 14, 13, he says, for thou hast said in thine heart, and he's talking about it, uh, Satan, right? He says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation. Well, who is this congregation? And who is this mountain that, that he's talking about? Well, many people use the word divine counsel. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically use the word divine counsel, and I'm a little hesitant about using it because the Mormons have taught it to be this council of human beings. And what we're going to find out is this council, a better way of saying it, this heavenly council, this group of beings that are gathered around the throne who are with God there, and this, this council, and we're going to see it. The reason I don't like using the word divine council is, like I said, the Mormons are going to automatically attribute that to a bunch of human beings. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, who I study a lot after, uh, uses the term a lot. And so instead of just coming up with a new name, we're going to use it. But let's, let's look at it. Let's, let's look at, number one, where can we see this so-called council? So in other words, if we're going to say, hey, the divine council... Well, shouldn't we be able to go into Scripture somewhere and find it? Because remember, everything about our way of Bible study is not about ideology. It's scripturally based. If you can't find it in the Bible, then why are you babbling about it? Okay, so where can we find this? Well, we end up in Psalms 82 and verses 1 and 2. And what happens is, is we see in verse 1, God, and there's the same word, Elohim, right? Standeth in the congregation of the mighty. So once again, the congregation, uh, Isaiah calls it the, uh, the mount of the congregation, some, uh, the host of heaven, uh, the heavenly assembly, H however you want to call it. Here he's calling it the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods, Elohim. Notice he's using the word Elohim every time we see this. Sometimes it's plural, sometimes it's singular. Sometimes it refers to Yahweh, Jehovah God. Sometimes it refers to these entities that we're going to be talking about. Now, hang with me. All right. If you finish out the verse, now notice, he, he says in verses 1 and 2, He standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods, Elohim, how long will you judge unjustly, now this is God speaking to him, and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah. Now, you drop down to verse 6, he says, I have said, ye are gods, Elohim, and all of you are children of the Most High. Okay, hang on to that, because all of a sudden you're going to get in the New Testament, and you're going to have some demons refer to Jesus as that. Okay, that's important, because the Most High here is Yahweh, the God of gods, right? Now watch. He says, listen, ye are gods, Elohim, you're my children, but you're going to die like men. Now, here's what I know so far. I'm not a genius by any sense of the imagination, but I know if you're going to die like a man, then you must not be a man. I mean, hey, Eddie, you're going to die like a man. Well, I am a man. It, it, it's like when I look at my daughter and go, you run like a girl. And she says, I am a girl. <laughs> I, so, so here's what we got here. Whatever these Elohims are here, these gods they're going to die like men and fall like one of the, look at the word, princess. Right? Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Well, we know according to Deuteronomy 32, he's inherited one nation at the moment. But he's eventually going to inherit all the nations. And the reason being is there's some princes over some individual nations that we're going to talk about. Now, I realize, God, we're th guys, we're throwing out a bunch of stuff here. I have to set this precedent for you to understand why he went up Mount Transfiguration. 
Literally, I have to do that. I have to show you all this to understand why we're going to judge angels. Because if you don't get this down, you're going to go, huh? Okay, now. No, the name Elohim does not denote a set of attributes. We've already talked about that, okay? Now watch this. The name Elohim denotes more of a realm or a place which you are, not who you are. And I, I, and I added the word southerner, right? So if I call you a southerner, that didn't, doesn't denote necessarily an attribute of who you are, but more of where you are where you're from, if you, if you will. Now you say, well, there's no way of proving that. Hang with me, okay? Now, before I get to, back to this point, look at Yahweh is Elohim, but not all Elohim are Yahweh. You, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, God is an Elohim, but not all Elohim are Jehovah Yahweh God. Now we can all agree on that is in the fact of, here, here's a simpler way. All angels are angels, but not all angels are Michael the archangel. He is a specific angel. So God, Jehovah, Yahweh, is an Elohim, but he is not like the other. There is something different about him, and we're going to get there. Now, here is a understanding that sometimes humans were referred to as Elohim. Now, watch this. Hang with me. So you guys know the story, Saul can't seem to get a hold of God. God checked out. So he goes down to the witch of Endor, and she does a little, you know, witch's brew and works up some stuff. And all of a sudden, she starts to see in the next realm, and it says, And the king saith unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? So he's asking, What are you seeing? She says, And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God's Elohim ascending out of the earth so wherever these gods are they're in the earth at this point now notice this and she said he saith unto her what form is he of so now he's going to get specific oh oh you see an elohim okay what does he look like so she says and I'm, I'm getting a little twisted up here he says and he saith unto her what form is he of and she says an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle and Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and he bowed okay now and you know Samuel gets a little fired up hey what do you bother me for I'm resting okay the he that she describes she called an Elohim now, why would he be called an Elohim? Remember, Elohim doesn't denote a set of characteristics. It denotes a place. Well, where is Samuel? He's in another realm. So these beings are spiritual beings. You, you guys would agree with me that Samuel's body is decaying somewhere at this point. But he is spiritually coming up right okay these elohims that eve thought she was going to be like were spirit beings god who sits on his throne yahweh is a spiritual being they're in a spiritual realm so when we start talking about principalities and powers remember they're not flesh and blood they're in a spiritual realm so let's get back to this council where can we find it at right now, Psalms 89, now we were in Psalms 82, but now we're in Psalms 89, 5 and 7. He says, and the heavens, notice lowercase,